So what we want to focus on tonight was particularly what the non-native population, what we can do to help create a climate where these voices that have been underrepresented can be better heard. So what might that role be? Some of the elements for us might be an, a simple attitude of listening or being open, uh, allowing for multiple evolving voices. You know, it's very interesting. We often talk about our, um, our, our kind of shared history as a unifying as a unifying process. You know, we often talk about a unifying history, but in this case, we're talking about a history that is composed of voices with different perspectives. So, native person said that he uh, that they view they view Thanksgiving differently than uh, than I would necessarily. I kind of struck home. So one of the things is, is creating an attitude, uh, attitude that accommodates for listening and seeing the native community as a mosaic of tribal and individual people, right? It's not a monolithic community with one set, one big common view. And one of the interesting things I think is to look at the narratives that have been present about native people and looking at distinguishing fact, fiction, and folk, frankly, folklore among these very popular narratives. And I think we have some pretty interesting examples about that. And Melody's going to talk about Melody being uh, involved in land use uh, in Rhinebeck and elsewhere for uh, 18 years, going to talk about the role of being the eyes and the ears for the native community to alert them to uh, resources that may, uh, may wish to be presented. So I talk first about a multiple perspective and I often refer people to uh, this woman's talk. Uh, she has, I see now approaching 10 million views uh, from 12 years ago. And she talks about what it's like to grow up uh, black in Africa, but be exposed to largely white stories and role models. And I just, it's a TED talk. Sometimes ourselves, we might have a different perspective. And I like to use this example of this gentleman. Marcus Robert Weir had a very optimistic view of the arrival of Henry Hudson. Robert Weir painted this in 1835. And he shows, uh, of course, a heroic Henry Hudson and native people who are very robust and a native, a native uh, land that is very green and verdant. If he was very optimistic at the time, he was about to take a position as the head teacher of painting at West Point, and the Seminole Indian Wars were beginning to rage. And the native people, someone at West Point, were beginning to look more like an enemy, something different. And Robert Weir redid this exact same painting uh, in three years later with this perspective. And you can see that it's a dramatic difference, right? So now uh, native people are, instead of uh, robust and healthy, they're kind of uh, dark and foreboding. And even the, the surrounding land is no longer green and verdant, kind of barren and in need of uh, husbandry and keeping up from Europeans. So when we talk about the need to accommodate different perspectives from different communities, I always like to remind ourselves that we can have different perspectives from one individual. Circumstances can change, their feelings about the subject that they're painting can change, and uh, they change the depiction accordingly. That's uh, Hudson's arrival at for Planck's point by Robert Weir. One of the things we consciously did six to nine months ago, Melody Moore, Will Tatum, and I are co-editing the upcoming yearbook. And we are hoping to publish lesser told stories that could include stories of native people. So we've been making a conscientious effort to uh, understand the uh, perspectives of different groups. And I wanted to recommend to everyone, Val LaRobardier has done um, a very interesting moderated panel 
that she hosted through the Dutchess County Genealogical Society. And she did that uh, only just a couple of months ago. And it's on our website, dchsny slash erased, because she talks about erased history. And uh, I recommend that. Another great advisor to us has been Bard Professor Christian Crouch. She's the author of an article called The Black City. And I was going to offer, I'm offering, I can share that article. I thought I could just post it, but I think for copyright reasons, I can't. But she had recommended that article to us. And it's a very interesting perspective, um, uh, kind of overview that I can share. And she's working with us to look at how native people are depicted in some of the WPA murals in the Rhinebeck Post Office in Poughkeepsie and in Hyde Park. And the other people we've been speaking to, the Muncie Stockbridge, uh, Heather Bruegel is the Director of Cultural Affairs there. And Bonnie Hartley is the Historic Preservation Manager. And they have uh, begun conversations with us about how to uh, look and examine these stories of native people here locally. The Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, when we spoke to uh, Bonnie Hartley, she directed us to look at this map that is a particular area of interest for them. And you can see that Dutchess County is very much in the middle of that. Bonnie Hartley in particular is involved in the repatriation of uh, human remains and cultural artifacts to the Stockbridge Muncie people. And this is the area of concern uh, for them. Through the Open Space Institute, which bought uh, an island uh, further north, and they've returned it to Stockbridge Muncie as part of an effort to return important historic lands to the people themselves. My name is Charlie Burgess, and I work for the Open Space Institute. My name is Bonnie Hartley. My name in our language is Tehe Quindohat, which means she has her arms around the people. And I serve as the Tribal Historic Preservation Manager for Stockbridge Muncie Community. We're here today to celebrate the return of the Patchkenny Island Preserve to the Mohican Nation. The Mohican people have a long-standing history at Patchkenny Island spanning um, known to be at least 12,000 years or so based on the archaeology. The place is more than just a sort of domicile. It's believed to be one of the longest continuously cultivated places in the United States. It's also a place of uh, ritual and sort of sacred importance. It's a place that we continue to return to, even though our community is displaced now to Wisconsin. It's a place that um, is still kind of a um, cultural touchstone in a way that we can come back to and we can, you know, directly communicate and, you know, draw strength with our ancestors here. In the 90s, the, the development pressure became really intense. Big oil, oil tankers and petroleum processing plants, that sort of thing. So the Open Space Institute swooped in in the 1990s and purchased the property and preserved it as a public nature preserve. There are hard truths that we need to face about dispossession and injustice. The Open Space Institute is honored to have the opportunity to restore this land to the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican community. Um, so we're just really grateful to have this moment in time to work with Open Space Institute to receive um, this portion of our, our homelands back. And um, so much of our work is focused on trying to protect individual sites, important burial sites and village sites, you know, cultural sites so that we protect them from being destroyed and, you know, include visitors here in a respectful way and hopefully inspire more people to, you know, learn about our history and but I think it's just, it's a, it's a different type of experience to have, um, to really have it back and have it to be in our, uh, our management again, like that we're actually stewarding it the way that, you know, we did for so many generations.
Stockbridge, Munsing has been involved in an exhibition in Stockbridge, uh, which is interesting that it's both a physical exhibition like this, and it involves kind of a very uh, uh, common uh, kind of street tour that you take yourself, that you take yourself on. And I would think that the, the kind of exhibitions that they're doing in Stockbridge uh, are the kind of exhibitions we could work on in partnership with them on um, where they're helping us understand exactly what's happened locally from their perspective and, and telling it from their perspective. So I hope we're going to do uh, more work with them. I wanted to share just some personal experience in terms of being open and listening to what is around us that has some native influence. Uh, I had the opportunity in the city uh, to look at the original paths of um, Native American footpaths that are visible today. This particular junction is Gansevoort Street and Greenwich Avenue. And I was working with a group there to, to really come to understand how these paths emerged into ox cart, you know, and horse and carriage, and then ultimately roads. And one of the interesting things we, we discovered is that this ancient footpath, because it would make sense that the colonial settlers would kind of build on those roads, that the street leading to the river happened to be exactly aligned to the spring equinox. And I love this example because so many people cross that street at that junction, that's kind of an odd angle, and aren't aware that the reason it is this angle is that it's a Native American footpath, one of which is aligned to the <laughs> vernal equinox. And I, I, I mention it as an example of being open-minded and listening, because I think there are things around us and just beneath our feet, especially in Dutchess County. Henry Noel McCracken wrote one of the more famous books about Dutchess County history, and he opens it, wrote it in the 1950s, talking about kind of romantic terms. For a hundred years, the Duchess plowboy at the turn of his furrow would stoop to pick out a small three-centered piece of hard stone that seemed different from the rounded field of gravel. He'd observed its sharp point, its chipped edges, and its barbed stem. And McCracken goes on, he was the president of Astor College, he goes on to talk about how there are an enormous number of arrowheads and other tools from native people in Dutchess County, so many so that farmers literally find them uh, in their fields. And I knew from personal experience that that was true. Uh, when we moved to Dutchess County 20 years ago, we, we bought land that's a little hill. Turns out was called Indian Hill, surrounded by on three sides by a stream. And the neighbor brought me, the photographs on the left, the neighbor brought me uh, an arrowhead that his grandfather found in the 1940s, just in the way that McCracken described it. And this arrowhead is about 3,000 years old. So we know that where we live, uh, called by locals Indian Hill because of the number of uh, artifacts that were found there by farmers, that these kinds of evidence of the presence of a, this large civilization is actually right all around us. So these are my points about listening and being open. We don't have to listen or be open uh, from too far a distance to encounter the evidence of these people. Uh, Lake Warakamak, which is uh, still named that, is on the oldest maps and used as a point of reference. And it's another example, I think, of uh, these are the little nine partners maps from 1744 and uh, the, an earlier map from the late 17th century, all showing that a lot of the earliest settlers were working with native people and using native landmarks as means to subdivide, if you will, uh, the land and the settle. But this is like where Rackamack is in the, is in the north of Dutchess County. 
So my point there is keep your eyes open. It's, uh, it's evidence is all around us if we're open to it. I wanted to talk a little bit about real people and legendary people. Legendary people may or may not be fact-based. And I'll give you a couple examples, starting with real people who we know do exist. Uh, in terms of kind of well-known uh, groups, if you will, and tribes, I was advised by April Bizau at Vassar College some time ago to look at this particular map developed by a, a native person. I think it's Karapala tribal nation. Uh, and she said that this is unusual because it's a map developed by a native person and that this is their view of uh, some of the tribes and groups that were settled in our area before 1609 and before contact. So I put it there just kind of in contrast to this broader map, which I think is pretty highly regarded for the most part. It was developed by the Smithsonian Institution in the 1970s. And the point it makes seems to be holding up which is that the Mohican were uh, a large civilization that was uh, very much to the north. Southernmost point was the Roloff Jansen Kill, which around which Columbia County is formed, and that the Lenape or the Wappinger, part of the Delaware, great civilization to the south, and their northernmost reach was what we call the Wappinger Creek. And so it does seem like. Dutchess County was this transitional border area between the Mohican and the Wapinger. And this map kind of show, shows, de depicts that. There's been some discussion whether the, uh, uh, what is called Sapascot, which is not a native name, but uh, uh, English name, whether the Sapascot and Rhinebeck were actually more tied to the Western part across the river and that they were kind of this dividing line between Wappinger and Mohican. But somewhere in this range, you had uh, kind of the northern and southern border of these two communities. I was going to talk about Sapaska and Rhinebeck, but I'll, I'll just leave it to say that the village is believed to have been around a significantly sized lake that is there. And what is curious is the idea that it might have been kind of the border between these two great larger groups. Rhinebeck. One of the most peculiar things in Rhinebeck perhaps was depicted by Olin Dows in 1686. There is this depiction of what's called a petroglyph. And there are photos that were uh, documented, especially in the 1930s by Margaret DeMott Brown that were published in our yearbook. I think this is one of them. So this is a combination of a rubbing and then a, a, a photograph of the rubbing. Uh, this is at Wildercliff in, um, in Rhinebeck. And there are even more contemporary photographs of it. A very recent newly published book, so this is a more contemporary photograph, talks about the Wilderst Wilderstein petroglyph uh, and its potential meaning. It may have been had something to do with the marking of land and the subdivision and bordering of bordering of lands. The other group that comes to mind, Shikomako is uh, in Pine Plains and this monument remains from the 19th century. The Shikomako were famous because they were uh, in, this, in 1740 approached by uh, Christian missionaries and seemed re receptive to conversion to Christianity. And the experiment didn't last very long in that there was some concern um, with even state officials and the governor that a group of native people who become Christian and too close in a sense to society and too integrated to society could be a threat and there were forces working against them that really pushed this group of people completely out uh, and away from the, uh, from the area as a community. And this monument 
this monument remains, remains there. It's kind of a well-known painting. It was done in the 19th century. Uh, thinking about the idea of a, a native person, they're looking at a mask from uh, his pre-Christian days and holding a cross in his left hand. And this is a, the kind of idealized romantic notion that Christian missionaries had at the time when they were uh, wishing to convert native people to Christianity. Uh, Daniel Nimham, we know, was famous as a leader in Southern Duchess for making very persuasive legal claims to, uh, for, to, to land and claims that involved his going to England, uh, a very sophisticated uh, leader and arguer of uh, indigenous land rights that ultimately uh, he did not he did not prevail, but it's kind of our, one of our better known stories of actual individuals who um, were leaders in the community. One of the most surprising people we were introduced to through Christian uh, Crouch was not so much uh, Brandt, this Canadian uh, indigenous leader who is pretty well known uh, and associated with the Loyalists. But uh, it, we were, she introduced us to a story of an enslaved individual of Brandt. And it's, it is a woman named Sophia Pooley. And there was published in 1856, some narratives of uh, former slaves in the US who were in Canada. So remember it's 1856, it's just before the Civil War. 1850 is the Fugitive Slave Law. So you have more and more uh, either enslaved individuals or former enslaved uh, in, in Canada. And this is a, a firsthand recording from Sophia Pooley who explains that she was uh, an enslaved individual in Fishkill in Southern Duchess. And she goes on to explain and testify, this is Sophia Pooley's words that her father's name was Oliver Burthen and her mother Dinah. She writes in 1856 that she was, she says, I'm more than 90 years old. I was stolen from my parents when I was seven and brought to Canada. When she was seven, it was just before the Revolutionary War. When I was seven, I was stolen and brought to Canada. That was long before the revolution. There were hardly any white people in Canada. And she goes on to talk about um, her how the, the, her master's sons-in-law in Fishkill, who are people that we've investigated, Daniel Outwiters and Simon Knox. They're uh, individuals who were Quakers, they were loyalists, and they were enslavers. That these two individuals, she's now saying, they came into my garden where my sister and I were playing among currant bushes, tied their handkerchiefs over our mouths and carried us to a vessel, put us in hold and sold up river. And then, I will, um, will make this story available because it's actually in a book that's available online and I, I hadn't uh, been aware of it, but she talks about what it was like to be an enslaved individual with Brandt. She was not treated well by uh, his wife, but she talks about the extraordinary things she did, hunting deer. Uh, she's a very active and ambitious woman. And it's so rare to have a firsthand account. So she is uh, black, she's of uh, African heritage. And in this instance, we're in, we have the unusual situation where uh, the enslaver here is a native person himself. Um, this is what the story looks like. The book is called The Refugee of the Narratives of Fugitive Slaves in Canada. And the story is of Sophia Pooley. I came across this newspaper article only recently. It's a copy of a paper we have from November of 1779. So the war, Revolutionary War is raging. The New York Journal is published in Poughkeepsie. Uh, because remember, New York City is a loyalist in this period during the war. Uh, Poughkeepsie is not. And there's a runaway ad, runaway on Saturday the 13th, 
from the subscriber from James Morehouse in Dover, Pauling's Precinct in the state of New York, a thick set Indian boy, long black hair, about 13 years of age. He had on a claret colored jacket, a pair of short woolen trousers. Whoever takes up and secures the said boy giving notice so that the sus subscriber gets him again shall have $50 reward. And I, I shared this with Jim Merrill, the professor at Vassar who uh, studies this a great deal. And uh, he did confirm that there, there were occasions where native people were enslaved. So we've just looked at an, an instance where a native person was enslaved and a native person was an enslaver. And I guess this goes back to my earlier point about being open and listening. Because some, you know, I think a lot of the assumptions that we have or stories that we're told are not necessarily, um, it's not that cut and dry, if you will. And then uh, came across this recently, another Poughkeepsie paper called The Independence in 1833, run away from the subscriber, Samuel Bishop, uh, Bishop, an indentured apprentice. He's an Indian boy with straight brown hair. And then he goes on to talk about his uh, white fur hat and so on, and was 17 years old. Uh, so here's an instance of William Pugsley in Northeast, uh, in an instance where he has a, a native person as an indentured servant. So you, you can actually find a lot of different, uh, different relationships. I've been talking about these people as real people because we know Daniel Ninnam lived and existed and Brandt did. And then I talk about legendary people because it's a little less clear whether they actually lived or this is my question about or whether we're looking at fact, fiction or folklore in particular instances. And I wanna show you some examples of what I'm talking about. I found it interesting that the Pomeroy Foundation now has a folklore sign uh, from, brought to you by the people who have the very rigorous standards around historical markers. I think it's great that they have kind of elevated the status of folklore in this way. Always interested in folklore because Sometimes there's a grain of truth, but folklore is about those stories that we seem to need to create for some reason. So I find it very interesting to look at folklore and, and think about why these stories emerged in the way they did. So three cheers for Pomeroy for doing that. All in an effort to pick apart the difference between fact, fiction, and folklore. But this was uh, referred to us as a book by Christian Crouch at Bard. This book is uh, by Gene O'Brien and it's called Firsting and Lasting, Writing Indians Out of Existence in New England. And it's a fascinating read and well worth considering doing uh, for the Valley and Dutchess County. The point being that when you look at the narratives of histories that have been written largely by white people, you find uh, language like the first settlers and the first, and the Europeans are always doing the first things, right? And the native people are always in the position of being the last. And I thought, you know, once I started thinking about it in those terms, um, and I think any of the native people we talked about thought that the biggest misperception that they want corrected is that they're gone. And they want us to understand that they're here. And I thought, well, why do we think they're gone? And I couldn't help but think of some of the most popular narratives, right? What are some of the most uh, intense and enduring narratives about Native people? 1826, The Last of the Mohicans is written by James Fenimore Cooper. And if you look since then and consider not just how enduring it is, but how many different media it survives in. Silent movies, sound movies, Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, it begs the question, why is there so much attention and narrative put on this idea of the native people being gone? That the last of them was some time ago. And there's a very dramatic moment in the silent movie version where the white person <laughs> shakes hands with the last of the Mohicans and he exits right and is off. Um, so why is that narrative of what 
the O'Brien author calls the lasting. <laughs> Why was that so important? And are there examples of it around us? I apologize for keep going to my hometown, but <laughs> I've studied at the locust this, the most. This is in the town of Milan, and it's a, it gets a fresh coat of paint every couple of years. It says Indian burial ground, chief crow and other Mohican Chicomacos of Moravian faith buried here, last burial about 1850. State education, 1935. So. One of the things that's comfortable about the sign or would have been in 1935 is that these would have been the Christianized uh, native people that I was talking about um, at Chicomico, although that place collapsed only within a couple of years of 1740. So it's quite a stretch already on face value to consider the fact that this chief crow was buried there in 1850 when the group was essentially pushed out of the state uh, in the early 1740s. And if you poke into it a little bit longer, you find that uh, when the sign was applied for by a, a, a Mrs. Harrison, she applied for over a hundred of these blue and yellow signs that dot Columbia and Dutchess County. The little evidence she gave that this is true was that old men of this section tell of their grandparents seeing these daily and their burials in this place. So we know that Mrs. Harrison has not offered any uh, solid evidence. She has, she has just offered um, hearsay, basically. Well, if you read the newspapers right around the time that Mrs. Harrison sent in that application, she actually hosted a little tea party where this story was told. So if you read the, the local paper uh, in 1935, it says Indian occupation of Gallatin was recalled, uh, interesting choice of words, and it goes on to explain that there was a, um, a, a man is testifying at this tea party with Mrs. Harrison that there was a little girl on her way to school who passed a chief's wigwam each day. And this is meant to be in Gallatin, right on the border of Northern Dutchess County. And this little girl was on her way to school. And one day the chief gave a big war whoop and scared the little girl and she was frightened. The chief told her and allow me to quote, me no hurt little white gal. Then he grabbed her in his arms and took her to school and all was well. So, uh, and then the story goes on to say, the person testifying says, she grew up, married, raised a family, and I am her grandson. So this is the grandson testifying that indeed there was a chief crow. So, I mean, this, uh, uh, how could you argue with that or, or doubt that? But it turns out that in 1935, and this was first revealed in the 1970s by Bobby Thompson, who is still working on history locally. Bobby Thompson in the 1970s first exposed the idea that there was not really a chief crow there and that it was potentially a black uh, African-American burial ground. And indeed the more research we've done more locally is to discover that Bobby Thompson's hunch in the 1970s was absolutely correct. And we've found now uh, a number of newspaper articles that document the burial of blacks in that cemetery, referring to it as a colored cemetery. And the second owner, black owner, was a woman named Nancy Bradford. It became known and referred to as Nancy Crow Lot. Nancy Crow, a reference to her blackness, no doubt. And it is for this reason, we think that it became known as Crow Lot as the black burial ground. And then in 1935, it was reimagined, is the word we use today, I guess, it was reimagined as not a black burial ground of former slaves, but instead a burial ground of an Indian chief. My concern about not correcting these things visi visibly is that well-known historians like Shirley Dunn, who wrote The Mohican World, took a photograph and put a caption on saying that this was so. Uh, and I actually spoke to her because I was so concerned that 
I was misunderstanding something. Here she's telling the stories of Mohicans. Here she's referencing Chief Crow. And I said, you know, am I misunderstanding? Is there really a Chief Crow? She admitted that there was not really any evidence and that she was merely taking a photograph of the roadside marker. And this is why I feel um, it's important to add context and uh, Chief Crow may be, he may be, uh, maybe there was a Chief Crow, we don't know. And, uh, or maybe he was part fact, part folklore, we don't know. But we do know that blacks were buried there, including a Revolutionary War veteran who served this country and former enslaved individuals. And we're working to get some recognition of that so that passersby like uh, Shirley Dunn don't keep repeating the, the error. She also took a photograph of the site of, this is on the, just over the border in Columbia County, the site of the Manessa home. I have a better picture of that. Manessa, Prince Quack Manessa. So the sign says that this is the site of Manessa home, Prince Quack Manessa of the Mohican Chicomaco clan. Remember all these hundred signs were done by the same woman, Mrs. Harrison. And she obviously liked the Chicomaco clan but here we are now in Columbia County, we have the last known Indian there. And the interesting thing is when you start to peel back the layers of this, you find that um, you begin to see stories of intermarriage. And I think this is where it's probably beyond our ability to ever really know. Isaac Hunting wrote a famous history of Pine Plains, but he is the one who wrote about uh, Prince Quack Manessa being an Indian man. This is the word and history of Isaac Hunting in, the, in his history of Pine Plains from around 1900. And he really dove into this Manessa story. And this was a time when Indian medicine, of course, was very popular. In a way, this is the, how the narratives have been boiled down and simplified. So Prince Quack Manessa, actually turns out to have been a person who was called Prince Minnesee. And Prince Minnesee, uh, although he's known as a native here, is well known, he moved to Michigan, is well known as the head of a black farming family in Michigan. And I've spoken to, to descendants of Prince Minnesee in Michigan. I've asked them if they were aware that in New York he's known more as a native person. They said they hadn't heard that, didn't know that. And it's entirely possible, if not even likely, that there were intermarriages. So we, we don't know, again, how, how, how he was identifying, you know, never mind what his uh, exact genetic makeup was, but also, you know, how he himself identified. So like any good history, you just start to get to have better and more questions and better questions rather than answers. But uh, Prince Quack Minnesee, who was Prince Minnesee, is famous for being a native person in New York and a black person in Michigan. The depiction of 1609, uh, this painting by Edward Moran really became a, uh, in 1892, a kind of touchstone, uh, often repeated uh, uh, symbolic or iconic painting. And you find it in postcards, you find it in the Rhinebeck Post Office murals by Olin Dowes. He did the scene uh, in Hyde Park, right? It's a very, very powerful moment of first contact when Henry Hudson arrives and Native people are looking at him and their world is about to change. So this moment really becomes an iconic moment that is um, reflected in all these different ways. So we think about all those stories. We have stories about Indian chiefs and medicine men. We have stories that tend to talk about the last of native people and their, and their goneness. And yet they come back in the most interesting uh, and telling ways, if you will. So I found it interesting that the Boston Tea Party, all these individuals dressed as native people 
before they wreaked havoc on the tea boxes. And I was prompted to think about that when I was reading a story about uh, anti-renters uh, just over the, into the Columbia County border. These anti-renters who were wreaking havoc and rioting uh, against the sheriff and against the police, they dressed as native people. And so it's kind of interesting that uh, whites started to appropriate this kind of costume when they were trying to express some, some sort of real rage and danger. On the softer side though, there were clubs uh, like this one in Poughkeepsie. There was a red men's club. There were clubs where white people really took on the name of uh, native people. And in this particular instance, it looks like dress and uh, not quite bl blackface, but they're affecting the color of their skin to kind of reflect that community. This is, so you remember that the stories are, are about native people being gone and yet they come back in these different ways. And Craig Marshall had shared this photograph with me of the Schultzville campfire girls. And again, it's, when you bear in mind that the, narr the overriding narrative has been about the disappearance of these people, it's interesting uh, that Native people come back in this kind of imitated form um, in these different ways. So, uh, good. Melody will talk about protecting uh, cultural resources, but I just want to recap that, you know, because I'm in no way an expert on this, but I do feel I hear Native voices and Native people having things to say. And I do feel like we can be better listeners and that there are things right around us, below our feet, <laughs> how our streets are organized. Um, and that we can be more aware of kind of the cliches of the, the, that these people are not gone. Uh, and we can be aware of being caught up in those narratives um, and be more aware of, 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 of that context and guidance. And then uh, I, with that, I'll ask Melody to talk about this specific, the specific action we can take to protect cultural resources. Thank you, Bill. Um, well, I wanna thank everybody for inviting us to be with you tonight. And as you can tell, uh, we feel this is a very important topic. And I wanna thank Bill for giving us such a wonderful framework for this story. As I'm sure you can see, when Bill and I are asked to present or to write stories, we look to the documentable past. Um, we're used to looking at photographs, letters, objects, diaries, primary sources that contain the facts necessary to weave together a truthful narrative. But I think as you've seen this evening, there is always the question of whose truth is this? We've always known, but certainly events in recent times have reinforced the fact that my truth is not necessarily your truth, and that the job of historians is to be continuously re-examining our interpretation of the past and holding it up to be scrutinized through the lens of new information. So the bottom line, as you have easily seen, is it's not easy to tell the story of Native Americans much less the story of Native Americans in Dutchess County. Where do we as historians get our information about the Native Americans? I don't wanna to seem to be overly simplistic, but it seems to me that the basic difference between academic historians studying Native American history and Native American history told from the perspective of a Native American is the vehicle through which the history is told. While academic historians typically rely on the written narrative, native cultures not having that often rely on oral tradition. So while work continues to find ways to better understand this history, my question to us is what can we as stewards of the past do to help? My thought is that we must become more knowledgeable about and active proponents of the stewardship and preservation of the land, because that is where there is still evidence to help expand our knowledge. 
I'm talking about the role archaeology can play. I'm not, let me be very clear, promoting archaeology for the sake of archaeology, but instead making ourselves aware of how it can and should be used when no alternatives exist. I'd like to use the example of the nook um, to illustrate what information can be recovered when archeological work is properly conducted. The site is marked by this Pomeroy Foundation historic marker, and we introduced the Pomeroy Foundation earlier. According to the information on the foundation's website, before the arrival of Europeans to New York State, there was a thriving Native American community in the area now known as the hamlet of Wasaic. The sign says archaeological evidence found by Ken Hoadley shows that the Weebatuck Creek site was used by Native Americans for a camp and powwows in the early 1800s. And this sign marks the location of what was believed to be the camp. I think Bill has a couple of slides of where we, uh, where this Pomeroy sign is and what we're talking about in Wasaics. They are down in the town of, in the Wasaic area. Um, presumably this information is taken from Philip H. Smith's 1877 general history of Dutchess County from 1609 to 1876. If you note, looking at the book, that Smith chose to begin his history in 1609 at the point of contact. So even though Smith later in his book talks about Native Americans, he chooses to focus on this pivotal point that he considers to be important in 1609. And in the beginning of his book, when he refers to Aborigines, he talks about the disappearance of Native Americans. And you'll see this quote here. Um, and he says, until not a vestige of pure Indian blood remains within the county limits. And this is another very clear example of the lasting that Bill spoke of earlier, as early as Smith's history in 1877. Um, still, he goes on to report that several Indian burial places in Amenia are spoken of in Pequod tribal tradition, one on the lands of Myron Benton, another near Amasa Coleman's, and still the burial places of families in the vicinity. But he goes on to say of special note was the place by the river called the Nook near South Amenia, where the Indians were accustomed to holding their noisy powwows. Note that in Smith's text, he uses the word noisy, where the Pomeroy sign has conveniently not included that word. Smith continues, there were a few wigwams near the outlet of Swiss Pond. Certainly this is all anecdotal and there are no empirical facts to give us an understanding of Native American culture in this area. The story might have remained unchanged were it not for the silo ridge development that took place in Amenia. The phase one archeological survey, Silo Ridge Resort Community of 2006, was undertaken by the town of Amenia and the Lewis Berger Group, and it revealed much more specific knowledge um, that has expanded our understanding of the site. The evidence led the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation to conclude that there were numerous pre-contact and historic archeological sites within three miles of the project site. So what was once by Smith just described as a place for noisy powwows has now been identified as an important Dutchess County Native American site. While we might wish that development pressure would never result in the disturbance of important Native American sites, it's important that we be prepared to take action to preserve and protect as much as possible. I've had the pleasure most of the time of serving on the Rhinebeck Planning Board for 18 years, and I've reviewed many applications that include historic and cultural resources. Several years ago, recognizing that Rhinebeck could do a better job of protecting these resources, the town board created the Historic and Archaeological Preservation Advisory Group, better known as HAPAC. Their recommendations have helped the planning board to be more mindful of resource protection, 
and to ask for archeological surveys when warranted. So I ask all of us, what can we do to promote the protection of archeological sites so that they can become the resource we need in understanding the Native American history and culture? We can, as we're trying to do tonight, promote public awareness and education. We can, when we hear about it, report looting and vandalism to local authorities. Ken Hoadley wasn't vandalizing the property when he was digging in the Wasaic area, but there are people that continue to do that in unauthorized positions. We can respect archeological sites and leave artifacts in place. And we can document whatever stories have been passed down and map locations of possible Native American sites. I'd like to expand a bit on my last point, which is the collecting of stories and mapping possible Native American sites. And I think this is something that I like to put out as a challenge to organizations like yours who are interested in documenting and preserving the history of your community. So in 1920, the University of the State of New York published Arthur Caswell Parker's The Archaeological History of New York, Volume 2. The book covers the entire state on a county by county basis and summarizes what was known about Native American sites at the time. Uh, the next slide shows a map of Dutchess County um, that was published in this 1920 volume. And the list to the right of it shows sites scattered across the entire county. Everywhere from Pine Plains to Wappingers to Amenia to the town of Poughkeepsie, Beekman, presumably all points in between. What's very difficult to see here, if you look carefully at the left and throughout the map, you will see little red marks denoting the sites that had been identified, presumably by local historians that are listed to the right. Is it 100% accurate? Probably not, but it is certainly 100 years closer to the anecdotal stories passed down from generation to generation. It's a place to start. And I would challenge local historians and historical societies to take up the task of recording whatever they can glean from the written record and from the folklore about Native American sites. I would make sure that local planning boards and decision makers have this information so that when developers come to town or proposed building sites come close to these properties, appropriate attention is paid to making sure that care is taken to protect the site to the greatest extent possible. The next slide uh, is from the uh, New York State Archaeological Council, and I call that to your attention because in some cases, local planning boards, including Rhinebeck now, go so far as to require that a cultural resource investigation take place according to the standards for cultural resource investigations and the curation of archeological collections. The product of such investigations, like the one at Silo Ridge, can be a report that enhances our understanding of the site. In summary, while this may not be my past or past, it is our past as residents of Dutchess County and non-Native people can play an important role in protecting the resources that will help the story to continue to be revealed and understood. Thank you.